Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining our presentation today. Uh, I think we should get started. Uh, we might have a few more people trickle in, but that's perfectly fine. So uh, today, uh, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Christoph Seelman. I'll, I'll be uh, co-hosting this along with uh, Casey Kirlin, uh, who I think you can see online as well. Uh, we're talking about hybrid courses, lessons learned from multi-campus instruction. So uh, we're, we're both involved, Casey and myself, in multi-campus instruction, and we found that there's a lot of overlap between what we've learned there and, uh, and what you might encounter in a hybrid situation. So uh, we've put this together. So about myself, I'm in uh, mechanical engineering, so that's a Faculty of Applied Sciences. Uh, I've, I started about a year and a bit ago, so I'm still quite new to UBC and, uh, and rather enjoying it. Uh, Casey uh, here is uh, with Materials Engineering. So we're both involved in the Manufacturing Engineering Program uh, within the Faculty of Applied Sciences, which is a joint program with UBCO, which includes shared courses. So we have courses taught at UBCV attended by students at both campuses synchronously, and also courses taught at UBCO that are attended by students at both campuses synchronously. Uh, I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge that uh, I'm on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, fortunately located on campus, it's absolutely gorgeous here, and uh, I've just been loving the autumn that we've had and, and the brief bit of snow that we have recently as well. Very, very grateful uh, to be here. And uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Casey introduce himself. Sure, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the good introduction so far, Christoph. Uh, so I kind of describe myself as Christoph's counterpart, but in the materials engineering department. Uh, we both teach together and, and do some research projects together as well. Um, and I'd also like to say that um, I'm gathered on the uh, traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Tuwassen people today, because I'm at home uh, out here in Tuwassen. So you'll be hearing from me later on. I think Christoph will be leading the first uh, bit of the session. So back to you, Christoph. All right, great. Thank you, Casey. So today uh, we're going to go through two, two or four, four areas. Uh, we'll begin with an introduction to multi-campus and hybrid instructional formats. Uh, just uh, it'll be a review, I think, for many of you. But uh, just to clarify some of the technology or the uh, terminology we'll be using, uh, I'll, I'll address that. Uh, I'm going to highlight as well here what uh, what, what uh, the technical abilities you need to have at your end to to uh, experience every aspect of our of our presentation. So listening to audio and viewing slides and uh, contributing through Zoom chat will be part of our first module. Uh, the number two, technology and hybrid courses. So listening to audio and doing slides will be necessary for that. For our third section, uh, where we're going to talk about ongoing evaluation, which will be the, the center uh, activity for this, uh, for this workshop, uh, you'll be listening to audio speaking using a microphone and doing slides. So please be prepared to, to communicate through, uh, through Zoom. Uh, we're going to ask you to use a web browser and Google Docs. If you have any issue accessing these technologies, then please let us know in chat. You can contact Casey directly and we can find a workaround for you. Uh, there will also be reading Zoom chat, so uh, please have your eye on the chat when we get to that module. And entering leaving Zoom breakout rooms. We will have two breakout room sessions as part of our, our third section in this uh, workshop. Finally, uh, under four, we have interpreting feedback, where again, we'll just be listening to audio and doing slides and perhaps engaging in some, con uh, in, in some conversation. So uh, thank you very much also to those who have been uh, posting introductions uh, in the chat, and it's, it's we're just delighted to have you here. So I appreciate you joining us. Okay, let's begin with a, a, just a very brief activity to, to warm things up a little, uh, a little bit. So we wanna uh, posit a, a scenario for you and you'll find this will be a theme throughout this presentation. We're gonna ask you to put yourself in the, the mind space or headspace of students uh, experiencing these programs through, through a, a hybrid or, or multi-campus format. So imagine for a moment that you're an undergraduate student at a small rural college. You're attending an engineering program. Uh, you and 15 colleagues attend a class at a remote campus. So you're in a classroom, but you're watching the, the uh, course through a screen. So the, the professor is located elsewhere with her own cohort. Uh, using teleconferencing with a large university in a nearby city. Teaching assistant stands to the side watching the screen where the instructor is drawing on a whiteboard. And so everyone is focused on this screen where they're seeing this instructor right on a whiteboard through the screen. And then suddenly the screen goes blank. The TA looks startled and pulls out his phone. He's not really sure what to do. And so presumably he's contacting the professor, but after minutes, there's no change. And the TA just looks more and more frantic as time, time goes on. So in Zoom, in Zoom chat, just take a moment and, and think about uh, what you might be experiencing as a student in this situation. And then under six words, perhaps uh, pose uh, what, what's running through your mind or pose what, what emotion you would be experiencing or um, yeah, yeah, re relate your, your experience in that moment in this situation. All right, excellent. Yes, we already have some coming in here. So there are so many other things I should be doing. What a waste of time. What are we missing? Anxiety and worry, waste of time. Right, so that seems to be a common theme. Will this be on the exam? Yes, excellent. I take an opportunity to have a bio break. Yes, uh, understanding that this can happen. 
<laughs> and we have some, uh, yeah, a little bit of self-censorship happening as well, which, which is certainly uh, <laughs> reasonable considering the circumstances, especially if this is not the first time. And, and certainly in situations like these, if technology is flaky, it may not be the first time. So we've, we've had students in this situation uh, and, and it can be a bit of a crisis to work through. And if it's, if it's a consistent issue within a course, it can dramatically impact the, the student experience uh, within the course and create a very big discontinuity or, or uh, issue with equity uh, be, between multiple cohorts. So that's, that's one of the themes we'll be talking about today. I pay good money for this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, in, in, I'm gonna pose one more scenario. It's so, some, somewhat similar. So here you're an undergraduate student at a large university attending a course remotely from home. And so this is actually very similar perhaps to what a lot of students experienced last year in terms of attending courses, which were fully online. Um, 100 students are attending in person. So this is a big course, let's say. We have a number of students that are in, that are in person. Let's say you're too far away from campus uh, or it's offered in a hybrid format. And so you can't come to campus every day. And so you attend remotely. 50 students are attending through Zoom. Some, but not all content is available asynchronously. So we have, let's say some lesson material posted, but not everything. Classes in the middle of a QA and a discussion and suddenly audio disappears and video freezes. So you're sitting at home uh, within your quiet space, perhaps your bedroom, audio disappears, video freezes. You're in the middle of a QA and a discussion. Um, and you're beginning to wonder, is this a local problem with your headset or internet? Minutes pass with no change. You don't really know potentially how to resolve the issue. So similar conversation or similar idea. What, what goes through your mind in this situation? Putting yourself in the headspace of students. Anxiety, frustration, panic. Once again, this question, I pay good money for this. Absolutely. But anxiety, frustration, log out, log in. Yeah, uh, wonderful. So, so problem solving as well, trying to fix the problem yourself. Uh, not knowing what to do, shrugging your shoulders, uh, perhaps a... a Bio break as well, lost, lost my concentration is a very, very good one. So what can happen here is it can break the rhythm of the course. If you're engaged and, and uh, right in the middle of, of that cognitive zone where you're, you're interested in the discussion and you're wanting to contribute and then you lose that connection, that can absolutely break that sort of enchantment and, and put you in a position where again, you're suffering anxiety and disillusionment. What am I missing? Another very important question because a lot of these Q&A discussions will lead to content that's relevant to the exams. So. Uh, somehow be penalized. That's an interesting question as well. So what, what kind of uh, penalties could be in place if you miss content in the course? Uh, can't afford a better laptop, right? So accessibility is a big concern or consideration as well. So wonderful feedback. And, and I'm glad that you're thinking in these terms uh, because these very much, I believe, are questions that, that students have fought with over the last year or two uh, as we've switched to online and we've had um, lots of new questions about how we use technology in the classroom come forth. So today, uh, there's four primary learning objectives uh, that I'd like to cover. Uh, discuss the importance of technology in hybrid and multi-campus education, uh, using contextual case studies, contrast pedagogical technological factors that can affect equity and accessibility in multi-campus and hybrid settings. It's a very, very wordy way of saying that we want to talk about technology as pedagogy in, in hybrid and multi-campus courses. Uh, apply the community of inquiry survey to assess student experience in a hybrid course. Okay, this will be our main activity for, for the session, which will happen about halfway through. And then reflect on COI survey results as part of continuous improvement in multi-campus and hybrid teaching. So how do we then use COI results uh, to, to improve our, our uh, delivery of our course or design of our course? I'll begin with uh, what is multi-campus and hybrid instruction? So I, I've alluded to this a little bit with our introductory activities, um, but let's begin with classical lecturing. It's something I think we're all familiar with, I'm, I'm hoping, or interested in at least, I've experienced at some point. So professor and students co-located a single location. You have a big classroom, you come in, you sit down, uh, instructors at the front behind a desk or a lectern of some sort, lecturing away. Um, primarily happens yeah, in the classroom, very traditional in, in many respects. We then have remote virtual learning, which is what students experienced last year, uh, certainly at UBC, where the professor and students are all separated from one another. So we have the professors sitting at home, teaching to students who are all located uh, at, at their own homes or, or in perhaps small groups uh, sharing, uh, sharing technology. So uh, remote virtual learning can include synchronous and asynchronous components. Uh, next, we have a flexible hybrid model or high flex, which uh, it's a term that's, I think, becoming more popular. It's been around for about a decade or so. Uh, this is where uh, students choose remote in-class or purely asynchronous learning. So they have the opportunity to either work from home or work within a classroom space or attend the course asynchronously potentially, uh, with the emphasis being on flexibility. So the emphasis is on student choice and learning experience. Uh, they get to decide how they'd like to attend or experience a lot of the uh, um, outcomes or, or objectives of the course. And I'll, I'll take this moment too to kind of clarify what, what we mean by hybrid and blended, because I think those, those terms are often convolved or, or, or used interchangeably. 
So uh, for, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, hybrid learning, uh, we're, we're treating this as an educational approach where some individuals participate in person and some participate online. And so we have a situation, again, where we, let's say we have a number of students who are located at the campus and then perhaps a variety of students who, who are located too far away to attend daily. They might be, this could be far up north, let's say in BC, or some other location where they're attending from home in a small community that's far away from, from their campus and therefore they, they attend remotely. Uh, versus blended learning where instructors and facilitators combine in-person instruction with online learning activities. So this is where you're teaching in person, but you also have some asynchronous content or other content online that students engage in, let's say discussions, for example, or discussion forums. So our focus is, is primarily in this model here of hybrid learning. And then finally, uh, multi-campus learning. Uh, so this is multiple groups of students at separate campuses in classrooms. This is the second example that we started with. This is where we have uh, a standard lecturing scenario, uh, classical lecturing, let's say at one, one, lo at one location, but using ICT or teleconferencing, uh, another campus is connected remotely to the, the originating campus. So we have a professor at one location with one cohort, and then we have one or more additional cohorts at their own campus in their own classrooms with ICT technology or, or, or communications technology that are attending the course at the same time. Oh, and I should note, um, this can happen in the same area or another part of the world. And so there are many examples of multi-campus education where uh, they cross, cross cultural or even language divides. So uh, there are case studies that we know of where, where let's say you have uh, students in Africa taking courses uh, in a multi-campus format from, from uh, professors in India uh, because they, they lack some of those um, uh, experts, some of that expertise in, in their own community. So anyway, if you're interested in multi-campus, uh, we did deliver a slideshow for uh, last year, Challenges and Benefits of Multi-Campus Learning. It's available at this link, which uh, I think Casey can drop into the chat. And uh, you're welcome to download those slides and review them. I think we also have a, a recording made by uh, Ainsley uh, as well that's available if you're interested in learning more. Okay, so without further ado, I'm hoping that those terms are somewhat clear. Let's, let's move on to talking a little bit about technology and hybrid courses. This is the second component of our presentation. So the importance of technology. Now, hybrid education is very much driven by technology. It's, it's, uh, students have to connect to your, your uh, stream or connect to your video or some way attend your synchronous presentation through some remote uh, format. And, and unless the professor is just yelling really, really loud and there's students sitting outside, you're going to have to have uh, Zoom or, or uh, some kind of teleconferencing technology provided by the, uh, provided by the university. So uh, technology is a big part of, of successfully engaging in hybrid education. Uh, there's, there's kind of two main aspects where technology plays a role. There's synchronous, where the instructor engages students in real time, and asynchronous, where materials and activities are provided online through a learning management system like Canvas. So in a synchronous uh, format, you have an ICT equipped room uh, or real-time chat or face-to-face -face in class or Zoom or WhatsApp on your phone. There, there's some kind of technology in place that lets a professor stream themselves uh, through um, again, a technology like Zoom, to students who then consume or participate in the course remotely. Depending on where you are in the world, this might happen through a phone. So the student might be using the phone or they'll have a computer or a laptop. It can vary. Um, the important thing is that it's concurrent and that the, the instructor paces the activities. So the, the pacing of the class is, is uh, at the behest of the instructor. They're, they're dictating how students experience the content uh, and they set the pacing for the content. This means a little bit less, less flexibility for learners, but again, it's a very traditional mode of, of teaching through, through synchronous. Um, the nice thing about this is that it provides a strong sense of social and teaching presence. You're, you're engaging in real time with the instructor, and so you have that ability to interact, and it gives you a stronger sense of, of not only teaching presence, but also social engagement, because you're often there engaging with colleagues as well. You're using chat. Uh, you can see colleagues around the classroom, see video feeds. Um, of course, technological failure or technology failure leads to a disparity between local and remote students. If you have situations where students are attending locally and students who are attending remotely, if technology fails, then it's the remote students that suffer more so than the local ones. Finally, so next we have asynchronous, uh, enabled by learning management systems such as Canvas, video and learning, uh, videos and learning content can be posted online. Students, uh, right, this is independently paced activity, so students will uh, consume the content at their own pace. Uh, I think we've encountered this through some of CTLT's other offerings. Uh, they have lots of courses online or workshops that require a bit of asynchronous work before you can get into the synchronous component. Uh, student, so for this, the social engagement activities are usually short and, and involve some distance, such as discussion boards, which is great, but you, you lack a little bit of that social engagement because it's not really as real time. 
So some of the technologies involved, uh, so classrooms equipped with information communication technologies. So we have multi-campus uh, uh, teaching, which, which depends on having teleconference technology inside your classroom. If you're engaging in this, there, there are certain classrooms around UBC that are designed for teaching in this format. And so they'll have microphones throughout the classroom. They'll have cameras that will follow you as you walk about. Uh, and, and this is state-of-the-art stuff. So, and, and that's generally what's needed to, to, as much as possible, convey that sense of presence to the remote location. So um, classrooms are equipped with ICT technology are rare on campus, but they exist. And usually there's one or two per department. They're, they're quite valuable. Um, they require training though. They're, they're not easy to learn how to use. Um, yeah, so hardware and software in this case is controlled by the university. And this can be at the, at the remote end as well, where they're projecting onto a screen. Common in Okanagan campus. Yes, I've heard you guys are, are really going down this path, which is amazing. That's fantastic. So I'm really happy to hear that. Uh, streaming broadcasting technology, uh, such as Zoom. This is a little bit more ubiquitous. I think we're all quite familiar with this right now. Uh, it can be used in hybrid teaching. I think a lot of us have streamed our lectures uh, over the, the last few months. Uh, it's a little bit less consistent uh, in, in terms of classroom technology. Uh, depends on um, your laptop microphone and camera, uh, depending if you're using a lapel mic or if you're using a boom mic. Uh, some, some instructors perhaps are not using a special mic at all, they're just using their camera mic. So you'll, you'll see a little bit more variability in terms of quality in this sort of experience. And there's also a great deal of responsibility on, on behalf of the students to, to uh, be prepared with the appropriate internet, computer software, and uh, also location. And this is something that's often overlooked is that students who attend remotely have to have a quiet, comfortable space where they can attend uh, courses remotely in a synchronous sense without a lot of distraction uh, or, or other such issues. And then finally, learning management system. This is used more for asynchronous instruction, which is again, managed by the university. Students access it through personal or university owned hardware. So again, this is once again, more under the control of, of the university, but students still have to have the technology necessary to access the LMS. Okay, just a, a point from uh, Tamara, Zoom now linked in Canvas. So hybrid between streaming and LMS. Zoom is linked in Canvas. Uh, yeah, so we do have a bit of a mix between streaming and LMS, but what's happening in Canvas is that uh, you're basically just getting a link to Zoom. So the the uh, the technology that actually engage, that, that you synchronously for communications is, is still the, the, the Zoom infrastructure. Uh, but, but certainly integrating it with Canvas has made things easier. Okay, so a big part of this uh, and, and, and a very critical part when considering technology is, is uh, equity and accessibility in both hybrid and multi-campus courses. Uh, this, this is particularly apparent in a multi-campus setting, but it certainly applies in hybrid as well. So questions such as, do all students have access to the technology necessary for the course? We can't always assume that students have a laptop that lets them attend a course remotely. Uh, do all students have a quiet private place to experience remote course content? If, if students are on site, let's say, and you're asking them to attend or on site as an on campus and you're asking them to attend a course remotely, do they have a place on campus they can attend uh, such a course that's quiet where they can talk, where they can turn on their camera and they're comfortable to do so? Do they have a place at home where they can do so as well? Do they have an adequate internet connection? These, these are all questions of accessibility and equity and uh, well, quite frankly, inclusivity as well. So we, we make certain assumptions about the technology and, and availability of, of uh, resources to, student, to students who engage in these types of courses. We have to ask ourselves questions of financial hardship, uh, noisy and safe environments, and uh, also always, what if technology goes down? So if they're, if they're attending a course through their phone because that's all they can afford, what if that phone dies or what if they lose their 4G connection or something along these lines? Uh, there, we, we put a lot of onus on the students to, to um, provide the technology they need to experience courses through a hybrid setting. So uh, it, it's something we should always bear in mind when preparing these courses and preparing the content uh, because we have to respect the possibility that students may simply be unable to attend the course because of technology failure at their end. So equity of learning experience, engagement, and community are three big questions that should be on your mind, uh, certainly when designing a course like this and, and delivering it as well. Following up on that, um, towards equity. So when, when we talk about equity, remote and local students have comparable fulsome learning experiences. It's, it's rather difficult to claim that it's possible for students who attend a remote course in a hybrid setting to have the same learning experience or an equitable learning experience to those who are actually there attending in person. Uh, I don't know if it's feasible to achieve that or even really necessary to target it. But what we can do is do our best to ensure that students attending both remotely and locally have a fulsome learning experience so that we uh, adapt, let's say, or we, we provide some extra provisions or consideration for students who are attending remotely uh, that uh, to, to compensate for, for that lack of teaching presence or to compensate possibly for technology failures. We do, we do our best to ensure that their experience is 
uh, um, excellent without necessarily being the same as the students that are there in person. Context is extremely important, uh, not just the context in which the course is delivered on site, but also the context that other students are experiencing uh, either at their campus or, or uh, connecting remotely through their technology. So engagement activities must be designed to encourage interaction and motivation for all participants. It's especially hard to achieve this if, if students are being uh, constantly tempted to, to engage in other activities while, while attending a course remotely. So um, de developing your activities to be uh, heavy in interaction and motivation is very important while still adhering to learning outcomes. Three types of interaction that should be considered uh, is student and instructor interaction, uh, providing opportunities for remote students to engage with the instructor, student-student, as well as student content. So these are three levels of interaction uh, where, where activity should be constructed to convert all three. Okay, uh, best practices and instructions. So some things to consider is contingencies and training. So what if a key piece of technology goes down or what are my responsibilities? What are the TA student responsibilities? This is, um, I don't often see this well laid out. So a lot of people who engage in, in hybrid instruction don't have a contingency plan in case uh, in, in place in case technology fails. Uh, you may even want to build a worksheet in advance and meet with your TA and say, okay, if, if you're on site with students in a remote cohort, uh, or you notice that technology has failed. So, so let's say I've, I've, my, my audio is, has dropped out. What do you do? How do you correct the problem? How do you take over the course at their end? So having a plan in place at the beginning of the course to consider contingencies is, is very, very, very helpful to address sudden uh, issues with technology. Uh, fairness, so minimizing cohort favoritism is also quite challenging because as instructors, we feel, I think, uh, more connected to the students with us in the room than we do to connect to, to students who are connecting remotely. So overcoming our own bias and, and really focusing on inclusivity uh, and engaging those students who are remote is, is uh, at least personally, uh, for me, a big challenge. And stressing fulsome uh, learning experiences when equitable is not possible as well. To achieve all this, ongoing evaluation is critical. So this means monitoring each cohort, local students, remote students, responding quickly if problems occur, and reflecting and continuously improving on your own practice. If, if we uh, don't respond fast, it's amazing how fast problems can snowball out of control. If, uh, if, if students who are attending remotely are just disengaged in the course and are suffering a lot of frustration and asking questions, why did I spend money on this, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, due to technical problems in the course. Oh, an, inter an, an interesting contrast to this, uh, actually, just mentioned here uh, by Tamara. Heard feedback from some instructors that they get caught up focusing on those attending remotely, sometimes not paying enough attention to those in, in, in person room. Right, so, so uh, finding a balance, and, and perhaps we're all biased a little bit differently, but, but finding a balance between the two and again, ensuring as much as possible uh, an equitable learning experience. So just to summarize a, a little bit of discussion I've had right here before we move on to, uh, to our next section. Um, I have here a, a, a chart. This is provided by uh, Bamani and Teltzfold, uh, specifically with multi-campus instruction, but does apply to hybrid instruction quite a bit as well. Uh, when developing a hybrid course or multi-campus course, you really should begin with contemplation, the contemplation level. So programs, training, and technology. What, what do you have to put in place before you can even begin designing your course to ensure that that course will be, an ex be a success? And, and this goes beyond just the instructor. This also includes administration, uh, technical resources, and others. Um, approach it with context-sensitive course design. Really consider context, both local context and remote context in designing your course and your learning activities in particular. Focus on equity and accessibility with technology in mind. Engaging activities that really get students move, like both um, uh, locally as well as remotely involved in the course. And uh, plan for interaction, so a lot of interactivity. When engaging in delivery, think of contingencies. So what if problems occur? What problems can occur? And have a plan in place so that you're not caught in the moment, not really knowing what to do. Um, intentionally engage remote cohorts and always observe and evaluate. And then in maintenance, adapt with technology. So as technology changes, make sure that you're staying on top of those changes and that the content you're delivering reflects the, the, the new opportunities that technologies or limitations that, that new technologies provide. Okay, and from here, I'm gonna pass it over to Casey who will take us on to evaluation. Great, thank you, Christoph, <clears throat> and thanks for that great intro or uh, great beginning to the um, to the talk today. Um, so, Christoph's kind of laid down some of the the fundamentals or the the groundwork. Um, I'll start talking about how we can evaluate that. How do you know if the course is going along well? 
um, and, and what kind of things to look for in that on that regard. So first, let's talk a little bit about the importance of ongoing evaluation. Um, so with multi-campus instruction, then you, you'll have kind of two separate cohorts and they'll kind of be working together, let's say socially kind of uh, with each other, usually at least, um, with, which is different from hybrid instruction where you have a cohort that's together, um, physically together, and then you'll have each individual kind of um, by, their, by themselves uh, somewhat in isolation. So it's, it's important to kind of take the temperature and see where, where different cohorts are at and maybe try to make sure everyone is, is engaged and, and continuing on with the course. Um, as well, the evaluation helps to inform the structure, uh, sorry, the instructor, um, if there's perhaps a culture of disengagement within the course. Um, hopefully we haven't experienced this, but sometimes maybe one or two students start to get upset and then they kind of complain to their, their colleagues and then more and more are kind of jumping on the bandwagon of, of being disengaged. Um, can also help you understand if there's some sort of perceived uh, inequity. Uh, maybe going to Tamara's comment about how um, the student or the instructors focusing more on the remote students, all of a sudden, all the in-person students are getting a little bit upset about that and they feel like they're getting the, the short end of the stick. So that's something else that evaluation can help with. Um, it can also help you identify any kind of inter-cohort animosity. So it's not uncommon where the, the two different cohorts will kind of become rivals against each other. Maybe one campus um, thinks they're, they're different uh, than the other campus for some reason or thinks they're better or, or worse. Um, or perhaps the, the remote students in hybrid instruction feel like they're um, you know, second rate students because they're just joining in online. Um, and then that kind of leads to, leads to some sort of animosity. Um, it can also help understand if there's a lack of trust with the instructor. So you can get an idea of if the students just don't seem to like the instructor or don't seem to be getting along with them. Um, and then finally, opportunities for either short-term or long-term improvement, maybe long-term being the next year that you teach the course. You can take the, the summer to improve it and, uh, and deliver it um, next term. <clears throat> um, as well, uh, An inadequate evaluation can lead to inconsistent learning exp it's experience for the students. So perhaps the two different cohorts are getting a different experience or um, something along those lines. So let's go into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so what types of evaluation are common and, and what do we, we kind of see? So self-reflection is always good um, in the form of post-lecture journaling. So we'll talk about this on the next slide, but just kind of thinking what worked, what didn't, what could I improve on? Um, maybe some sort of qualitative evaluation. So um, either formal interviews or focus groups or just informal discussions with students. Maybe the five minutes before class, just chat with them. How's, how are things going? What's working, what's not working? Um, or if you see them in your office hours as well. Or perhaps check in questions with the students during the lectures um, and make sure with these types of things, it's always good to make sure that you're doing it when all the cohorts are involved. So you, you wouldn't really wanna do your informal discussion while the, the online or the remote students are not um, engaged at, at that time. Um, and then finally, quantitative types of valuations. So Christoph and I are engineers, so we like, like numbers and quantitative stuff. So things like course surveys <clears throat> that we'll talk about in more detail later on. Um, and then the student evaluation of teaching, of course, which we get at the end of the term, these types of more, let's say concrete, um, uh, quantitative types of evaluation. So let's go in a little bit more detail here. Um, so self-reflective self evaluation. So this is something that's self-motivated um, and often in the form of, of journaling. So some sample questions to ask yourself, how many students attended synchronously? Um, are the students on schedule with their homework? Are they, you know, are they engaged with the class, keeping up with things? Did the local and remote students ask questions? Who was asking questions? Were the remote students kind of hogging the attention, asking all the questions because the, the remote students were having trouble getting word in edgewise or vice versa? Maybe the instructor is focusing more on the, the chat, more on the um, remote students and, and not really paying attention to the locals. Um, <clears throat> did the local, uh, sorry, did they also both participate in their discussions? Um, was one more so than the other and, and why? 
Um, were there any technical problems? So hopefully not. Um, these are always, or these can be a challenge to deal with, but it's good to know um, if they can come up and good to have a, a contingency plan, of course. Um, as well, what did I say off camera? So typically that means kind of what did I say to the local cohort that the other cohort couldn't hear? Um, and it, it might not even be something like, what did I say and actually happened, but what did the students that were off camera think I said, or maybe think I had an interaction with the local students? Because that per perception of having an interaction uh, that they were missing out on can become important as well. Um, and then, of course, what worked, what didn't work, um, and what can you do better next time? Just kind of thinking about these things and trying to prepare for the next session is, is uh, can be quite useful. Um, and then let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into evaluating the student experience uh, using what we call the community of inquiry framework. And this ties into the, the quantitative survey that um, I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this COI framework, uh, Community of Inquiry framework, but this is kind of the, um, the diagram that we use to explain it. And this is something that was developed by Garrison and, and his group um, in the early 2000s. And he's kind of, he's built on it since then and, and others have built on it and, and used it since then. Um, so you can see the, the three main areas, starting with social presence up here, uh, cognitive presence, over in green, and then teaching presence down at the bottom. And you can see how they all kind of interact with each other in the Venn diagram in, in one way or a few ways. And then they all kind of come together to create the student experience. And um, they all kind of fit in one way or the other. You can have maybe two that are quite strong, one that's weak, and that would affect the student experience or, or um, or all, all that are quite weak and, and all contribute to a poor student experience. But let's go into each of these in a bit more detail here. Um, so starting with social presence. So um, this is kind of the sense of well-being, uh, sorry, sense of being and belonging in a course. And Garrison um, kind of describes it as, or defines it as um, being uh, themselves socially and emotionally and kind of being a real person in the course. So for me as an instructor last term when we were online, this is something that I kind of had trouble with a little bit too, kind of thinking, you know, I'm having trouble interacting with people on any kind of social level. It's You always have to kind of beg them to speak up and turn their cameras on if you can even get them to turn their cameras on. Um, but that's what we mean by social presence. Um, we have to keep in mind too that the, um, the social interactions between the cohorts should be managed separately. Um, so what happens kind of um, in, in one group may be different than, say, all the, the online students that are all individual. Um, maybe you need to make extra effort to um, work, or get them to work together or get them to communicate. Um, but, yeah. Um, and then there's also the technical challenge, of course, of bringing the, the groups together and not just between the students themselves, but between the students and the instructor is important to keep in mind. I uh, mentioned before about the potential for some sort of adversarial relationship between the two cohorts. Um, it could potentially be healthy if it encourages students to, to kind of um, push harder and, and try to um, study harder, learn better so that they can maybe kind of um, compete against the other cohort, hopefully in a, in a healthy way. Uh, but if if it's left, then it can be very damaging, and it can be uh, can be a huge issue. Um, so the next part of the COI is the cognitive presence, and over here we have a, a figure from Garrison as well, and this kind of describes the cycle. Um, when we think of cognitive presence, we kind of think of alertness or engagement, being engaged with the course. Um, so we start out with some sort of a triggering event. Often this comes from the instructor. This is kind of the, um, the point where you, you kind of ask the students to think about something or show them something and, and ask them to think a little bit about it. And then they, we move on to exploration where they kind of question it and brainstorm it um, to themselves, think about it in, uh, to themselves before moving to integration where they're trying to kind of trying to construct some sort of meaning out of it. Um, and then finally, and hopefully they get as far as this uh, um, to resolve it, 
and apply this new knowledge that they've just gained. And the idea is that if they can complete the cycle, then they have a better understanding of the material. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, activities may not resolve neatly for all students. Um, and possibly it could be the difference between one cohort is, is resolving all of these, um, these concepts and ideas, whereas the, the other cohort isn't. Um, or maybe, you know, one cohort's only doing that with half of them or something. Um, so we need to, to consider too how to keep the learners engaged uh, when they're staring at a screen because, you're, I mean, you're all experiencing it right now. It can be, um, can take a lot of uh, motivation and effort to, to just keep interested, stay interested. Um, as well from the instructor should be uh, considering that. How do you make things interesting for people? And finally, we have teaching presence. And this is perhaps where uh, most people would think the, the instructor's kind of job starts and stops, but the instructor does have some sort of control and influence over the other two presences as well. But um, Garrison defines it as kind of the binding element that creates that community. Um, it's not just putting slides up and talking about them or delivering homework assignments. There's a lot more to it um, than that, as, as I'm sure we all know here. Um, it's, it kind of depends on the quality of the instructor's interactions. So are students happy to see the instructor, happy to run up to them after class and ask them questions or you know, pass by them in the hallway and, and smile at them? Or do they not want to even see them again for the rest of their lives kind of thing? Um, and that goes for both inside and outside of the classroom. So they can have, that can have an effect on inclusivity. Do the students that aren't physically there feel like they're part of the class or are they just kind of a, a fly on the wall that's observing and, and doing the same homework assignments? Um, it can also have to do with equity. Um, are, they, are they equal or equitable to the, to the remote or to the local students? Um, as well, does the instructor have authority in the classroom? Do people listen to them? Do they respect them? Do they feel that they're, um, they're worth um, putting their, their attention to towards the teacher? So we've kind of laid down the groundwork of, of what's in this community of inquiry. Um, and that's all well and good, but how do we actually measure um, the, these different presences and how, how can we try to measure this and make some sense out of it and possibly identify what's, what's a bit lower or what's not working as well. Uh, so luckily, someone else has helped us with that and done that for us. Um, so around 2008, Arbo and all, um, and Garrison was involved with this, um, but they developed a survey tool for this, this community of inquiry, for this COI. Um, and it's a 34 question survey with five point Likert scale for each question. And there was, uh, the, the results are broken down into, um, as you could imagine, teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive presence. Um, but then within that, even, even more so, those three presences are broken down um, into, into further uh, um, areas. So in, within teaching presence, we have design and organization, facilitation and direct instruction. Those are all evaluated um, within social presence, effective expression, open communication and group cohesion. Those are all um, assessed and evaluated. And then finally, in cognitive presence, a triggering event, exploration, integration and resolution. So the idea being that if your students take the survey, you can collect the results and kind of go over the results, see what um, what's working for the students, what's not, and then adjust, perhaps adjust your style um, accordingly. So something that we've been working on here at UBC um, is what we call the cost application, uh, essentially community of inquiry online survey tool, COST. Um, and this is kind of a way to just make using this tool easier for instructors. So it's basically putting the, the tool out online in a format that um, an instructor can use. They, they could go onto the, the website, uh, create a new survey link for their course. They give that link to the, to the students. The students fill out the survey you know, on their own time, maybe within a week or something. And then pretty much in, um, in real time instantly, the tool plots the data and performs a MANOVA analysis on it. Um, so that's what we can see over here on the side. And you could come to that tool, click on the button below, create a new survey for your course, generates a link, you send the link out to the students, 
and it gives you another link that you can use to check the results from. Um, so it's still somewhat a work in progress, but the tool is live and we'll actually see it uh, being used uh, later on shortly. Um, we'll do that. We'll use the tool shortly after we do our activity. So that's what um, we'll move on over to right now. Um, <clears throat> so let's do a little bit of role playing, break up uh, some of this um, this talking. But uh, let's do let's do a role play, and we'll kind of put ourselves into the shoes of a student that's uh, either a remote student or a local student, and we'll we'll do that by reading throughout uh, some journal entries that they've made. So they're just three little blurbs um, of three different entries in a journal that they've they've each made and written up and we'll kind of put ourselves in that in their shoes pretend that we're that student that we're um, that's that's written those journal entries um, and that'll help us highlight some of these common issues that we've been talking about so when we get back then we'll ask you to do the coi survey um, the coi survey is is that cost tool that uh, we just discussed here um, and yeah i see your comment there Tamara will share the cost tool survey really um, shortly here as well. Okay, so this is this is how the activity is going to work. Hopefully, going to work. Um, so our main group will be divided into four breakout rooms, and I'll um, I'll set those up in one second. Um, so when you're in the room, the rooms are named after the students, uh, the, these imaginary students that we've created journal entries for. So the name of your room will be the the, the student that you're, um, that you're going to role play. Um, read through the entry and then discuss with the other people in your room. There will be, depending on the exact numbers, maybe three, three or four people in the... Okay, thanks, Christoph, for posting that. Three or four people in the room with you. Um, the link is in the, the chat right now. Thanks, Christoph. And then after the discussion, we'll move you to a second breakout room. So basically, that's the breakout room of people in your cohort. So let's say you, you happen to be a, a local student, then we'll put you in a co in a room with other local students as kind of your cohort together. Same thing with the remote students. We'll put all the remote students together and just talk about your experiences, talk about kind of what sounds like what's working, what's not working from being in this class. Um, after that, we'll bring you back to the main room and we'll share the link for the COI survey for you as well. And then when you're done the survey, if you could please just click the little um, Zoom reactions to raise your hand or somehow indicate that you're done, um, and then we can move on to the next step. So let me open the rooms now. So we'll look at the results from the survey we just took very shortly. Before we do that, we just wanted to go over some um, results from a real course that we had. So in the unlikely event that something happens when we go to show you your results, at least we have some results here that we can look at. Um, so before we go into the detail exactly of, of uh, the results, let's talk about the class a little bit or some comments on the course. So a little backstory. So the local students had the instructor for a previous class. So they already had a little bit of a rapport with the instructor. They knew who the instructor was and kind of their style. Um, the material that was used in the class with both local and remote students was taught to the local students previously in another class, but the remote students didn't learn that same material. So they, the local students had a little bit of an advantage in that sense, or a, a bit of inequity, let's say, in that sense. Um, the remote students were often distracted and kind of not paying attention. If you were to walk into the classroom, you could tell, you know, they were on their phones or chatting with each other or that sort of thing. Um, as well, the remote students complained uh, formally a number of times about having trouble interacting with the instructor, and the, the remote students had trouble with the TA. The TA didn't seem to know what the instructor was teaching or what the instructor was trying to, to discuss or wasn't able to answer any questions, really. And half the time, the, local stu uh, the remote students were kind of just chit-chatting with, with the TA when they should have been doing um, activities. So we can see the results here. So this is what will pop up for your survey as well. And this is just the first of the, of the rest of the plot. Um, so it starts, we can see the teaching presence, social presence and cognitive presence. And might be a little bit small, but at the bottom we have local on the left and remote on the right. So just to begin with teaching presence right away is clear to say, to see that the, the local 
cohort, the students that were familiar with the instructor, they seem to have uh, or perceive a much higher level for the teaching presence. And opposite is true, the, the remote students had low, um, low perception of, of teaching presence there. The social presence, interestingly, was, was more or less the same. And you can kind of think of that makes a bit of sense because the groups are together with their cohort uh, physically present with each other. So they feel that kind of social environment um, together, perhaps um, not with the other cohort, but within their own cohort, cohort, they would feel that. And then same thing, we see a discrepancy in cognitive presence as well. So the, the remote students are having a bit of trouble um, uh, staying focused, staying on task, um, staying engaged and motivated. Um, conversely, the, the local students are, are more present, more cognitively present, you could say. Um, so we could look at the results on, on the website where they're posted and we could scroll down and then we can go into more detail on um, each of the subcategories with, within the presences. Uh, but let's not do that now. Um, let's look at our results and see, um, see if we can make sense of our results. So I'll pass it over to Christoph here. Okay, so let's have a look to see what uh, how we did here. So this is the data that was just prepared. Uh, to access it, I went to the first link that uh, Casey shared. So you, you can have a look at the data if you'd like as well by accessing that link. Uh, we can see, first of all, at the bottom, we had about uh, five people respond from the local face-to-face -face and six from remote through Zoom, which is great. It's a pretty small sample set, so you'll want to get more data, uh, more people involved to get like a really good representation of what's happening inside the class. Uh, but at first blush, we can we can look at our candle plots right here. We have our local face-to-face -face on the left and our through Zoom on the right. And this is already reminding me of something I need to clean up a little bit. So on the left-hand side, we have very strong teaching presence. So the, the in-person students felt the teacher was doing a great job. Um, the remote students were kind of in the middle. So what we're seeing here is uh, uh, fairly low average, a little bit below three. Social presence, very low social presence for the remote students in this case. So they, they really did not feel in, uh, that they had a social contact or connection uh, within, within the community, which is a very important observation because the, these uh, discrepancies do highlight a lack of equity in experience. And then cognitive presence students that were in person found the, the activities engaging. They really liked them, almost a five, like almost a perfect rating on this. So the instructor's doing a great job for that. Uh, but the remote students similarly feel a little bit less engaged. So they, they, they don't feel quite as, as taken into the activities. So the activities are not quite designed or tailored to, to accommodate them. Uh, since these are all quite significant, so um, the, the MANOVA analysis is nice. It shows us, uh, based on the number of students, uh, roughly where we're going to expect significance. And so the, the, uh, the, 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 there is a difference between the local and remote students is, is highly significant for teaching presence uh, and for cognitive presence as well, and, and actually quite significant for social presence too. So it's, it's uh, very, very much within that 5% threshold, which is considered significant uh, in, in a quantitative analysis. So right off the bat, you can see all three of these uh, show a very significant difference in, in perceived student experience between the local group and the remote group. Uh, we then do a subcategory analysis. So you can have a, a closer look at design organization, facilitation, and direct instruction to see if that, that difference persists throughout them. And, and here we see that certainly. So uh, for the local group, there's a very, very high, pretty well universally 5.0. 5, 5 Everyone thought that the direct instruction was great. And the local group, the remote group, again, lukewarm, didn't feel that strongly about it. Facilitation, huge difference there, big discrepancy. Design organization, also very significant difference. And once again, we're seeing some, some statistically significant differences, even though we have a very small sample size. So this is highlighting a very big problem with the organization of this course. Uh, cognitive presence, uniform across the board too. So triggering event exploration, integration, resolution, all these are beautifully highly rated. Instructors doing a fantastic job with the in-person students, but the remote students ugh, don't really feel it. So, uh, and, and they're particularly low in something like exploration. So they don't really feel that they have the opportunity to engage with the work. They, they feel interested they're, that that uh, triggering effect is there, but they don't really know where to go with it. And that, that might be connected to the lack of social engagement as well. So uh, yeah, this, this is the results page. You're welcome to have a look at it. Again, the survey is super quick and easy to set up. It takes less than 15 seconds to get one going. Uh, if you can have a look, uh, we'll provide the link at the end of the presentation, but essentially create a new survey, name of the course, institution, your email address to get you the links, different sections. So we could have remote, local, complete, and that's it. The survey is set up. 
So it's, it's super easy to set up. You can then email the link to the students to fill it out. You can then look at your analysis link and get the results right there. There's no login, nothing like that. It's intended to be as easy to use as possible. And as you all witnessed, it takes about five to eight minutes to actually complete the survey. So that's, uh, that's the tool. Oh, um, I'm not sure if Tanner is still here, but the link is this, coimech.ubc.ca. So it's hosted by Mechanical Engineering currently. Okay, so I'm going to uh, kick back into our slide. So thanks everyone for, for filling that out. Very interesting results. So uh, you, you represented your students very strongly. There was good grouping and consistency between your, your, your remote students and, and uh, in-person students. And it really did highlight that there were differences worthy of concern for this course. So this was a real course and, and the students filled this out halfway through the term, the instructor would need to act on these differences. These are highlighting big problems in, in how student experience is experienced in this hybrid course. Okay, so I'm just going to move through this quickly. I know we're just about out of time, uh, but let's talk a bit about how to interpret this feedback. So things that you're gonna be looking for uh, from, from the COI feedback results, uh, diverging teaching presence, which is something we saw in, in our case right here. So perceived inequity between instructors' attention, which means that there's possibly more focus on the local cohort or more focus on the remote cohort. In this case, the, the, the remote cohort did not feel that sense of teaching presence. So we saw that was much lower than the local group. Uh, poor facilitation, so remote, remote students are not able to participate in group activities. And we saw that as well cognitively, not just in teaching presence, but the, students, the remote students didn't feel engaged and, and even the local students noticed that. So in the journal entries, they, they didn't really feel connected to the remote students at all. Uh, direct instruction, ineffective or hard to understand, remote asynchronous material. Uh, if, if this was low and it was, then uh, it's uh, the asynchronous material perhaps wasn't well understood by the remote students. Maybe they didn't get appropriate instructions or maybe the instructions were given in class off camera, which can happen too. So, um, and, and this is something we have to consider as well for a hybrid course or multi-campus course, students may actually need to be taught how to learn in this setting. They, they may need actual instruction, perhaps in the first lecture on how to best experience the course and questions to ask themselves as the course progresses to ensure that they're staying on track. Trust is also very critical. And if trust is low due to a low teaching presence, then students will have even less engagement in the course. Social presence. So we have effective expression within the course. Uh, this was actually not that low. Um, so lack of community access to peers, uh, limited emotional engagement and expression in course materials. So the suggestion I think from the results that we saw from the group here was that there was still some social uh, uh, engagement even amongst the remote students, perhaps with one another. And, and maybe that second meeting where the remote students could chat back and forth a little bit helped facilitate that greater sense of social presence. But there was, I think, a, a, a very strong difference between uh, the remote students and the local, stu and, and the local students. There was that, uh, that sense of cohort or, or divert of, of um, dichotomy or difference between the two cohorts. So they weren't blending very effectively. Open communication, that was quite positive. So uh, there wasn't a lot of difficulties with technology, uh, which was great to see. So the instructor was conscientious about their use of technology. Uh, and nonetheless, students were not really uh, engaging that effectively through the technology available. Uh, and then group, group cohesion, similarly, uh, students were for, seemed to be forming good groups locally, but less so remotely in, in this use case. Then lastly, cognitive, I'll be very quick here. So interest, exploration, integration, resolution. Uh, so interest, you want to be able to capture the attention of both the remote and the local students, uh, give them that good trigger, um, um, tempt their curiosity. Uh, exploration, varying levels of access to resources. This was particularly low for the remote students. So they, they clearly felt very isolated. Local students have access to libraries, they have access to study spaces, they have access to lab spaces. Remote students don't necessarily have any of that. Uh, and, and so th this became very clear in the data that you yourselves generated, where, where exploration was one of the lowest rated uh, fields under cognitive for the remote. And yet locally across the board, this was nearly perfect. So the professor was doing a great job with his in-class students. Uh, integration, learning activity outcomes are not consistently reaching all students. So if, this, if, if there's a lot of divergence here, then similarly, uh, uh, students are experiencing their learning outcomes differently. And resolution, divergence, and concept synthesis, uh, synthesis and can achieve higher learning outcomes. If, if the students remotely are not engaged cognitively in the work, then they're not going to achieve those higher level outcomes where they can apply their knowledge. Uh, very briefly, I'm also going to summarize a few responsibilities moving forward. So this is not uh, delivering a, a successful hybrid or multi-campus course is not strictly the responsibility of the, of, of the uh, instructor. Administration has to be involved as well. So hybrid and multi-campus courses need time and resources to execute successfully. Um, there's training required as well. Uh, TAs need to be trained if they're involved in a multi-campus course. Uh, TAs also, if they're engaging students remotely, need a little bit of training as well to do so effectively, just like instructors. 
Uh, you also need appropriate classroom technology. So student needs, students need access to high quality microphones, cameras, laptops. If they don't have a camera on their laptop at home because it's an old laptop, they can't afford a new one, then they can't engage as directly or they won't have as much presence to their peers. Classrooms also need to be appropriately equipped so that uh, instructors have the technology they need to come across as, as vibrantly and realistically and brightly as possible for, for uh, both local and remote students. And then of course, you need to recognize the difference between the student experience. So virtual labs versus in-person labs, student clubs, study spaces, library resources, uh, physical presence, that context is very, very important in, in uh, assessing equity. The, the accessibility to, to resources beyond just a laptop. On to the instructor. So recognize that hybrid is not the same as face-to-face -face plus a video feed. And this, this is something that's particularly important with multi-campus and, and also very important for hybrid. So a very clear example of, of how uh, multi-campus falls flat and fails. If you just treat it like a normal course with video feed, you need to design your course from the ground up to be hybrid. You have to choose learning activities for every, every lesson that are more engaging and that can effectively bridge that local remote, remote divide. So engagement is critical. And again, focus on student instructor, student student, and student content interaction, All, every one of those levels. And, and really work to foster a healthy student community that bridges both remote and student and, and local students. Finally, uh, be aware that as an instructor of such a course, you need to provide training uh, for your teaching assistants and give them some indication of planning. So let them know what they can do to, to um, make the course run a little bit better. So what, what happens if communication fails? How, how do they resolve these problems? Give them, give them a checklist they can walk through so that they're not caught unawares uh, without, without a plan if things go wrong. And always keep equity and accessibility in mind through inclusive pedagogy. So that should be at the heart of your pedagogical planning. All right, and that's it. We're right on time, which is great. So good luck with your future hybrid courses. Thanks so much for attending our session. Uh, additional resources on the following uh, slides. So I have a few more in this presentation and also through the shared Google Doc. You'll notice at the bottom of the Google Doc, there's pages of resources on hybrid instruction. Uh, I encourage you to go through those. Uh, uh, lots of really great stuff, additional training if you're interested. The cost tool, you can see the link right here, coi.mec.ubc.ca. And uh, we have a couple of, it looks like we actually have a couple of different uh, surveys available. So this one here, is uh, one that we've put together, but it looks like a CTLT is asking you for one as well. So if you'd be so kind, it'll take less than two minutes to fill out our Qualtrics survey here, and uh, it'll help us a great deal in understanding how we can improve this uh, type of workshop in the future. So thanks so much again for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your uh, Winter Institute and uh, have a delightful holiday. Uh, we'll, we'll stick around for a couple of minutes if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th thanks everyone, and, and feel free to contact us as well directly if you have questions or want to chat about something. Steph and I are both happy to, to engage. Yeah, so we're looking for collaborators. So if, uh, if you're interested in this cost tool and would like to be more involved with that or try it in your class, then please let us know and we will do everything in our power to make that happen and give you the resources you need to use it. Absolutely.